What if I told you that you can make your 30 year old carburetor perform just as good, if not better, than a brand new shiny carburetor? Welcome to the nightclub guys, it's your host, the Night Wrencher. Now while I'm down in the dumps because my truck is broken, I decided to make this quick video explaining five hidden secrets of the standard Holly carburetor. Uh, and these secrets are things that I've learned with the, uh, in the last year um, that I went from knowing zero to learning quite a bit. I'm still not at the expert level, but I'm, I'm to the point where I understand um, more than the majority of people who have been working on carburetors their whole life. And I, I can easily say that because I, I can talk to people that have owned their Camaros or Chevelles or Challengers or Chargers, their Galaxies or Falcons. Or Mustangs and you go to talk to them and you're like, okay, what jetting are you using? Well, I don't know. The stock jetting has always worked out. Oh, what power valve are you using? Oh, well, I don't know. Whatever it came with. I uh, had to replace it one time, I guess. Or, you know, things like that. They, people just buy these carburetors and say, oh, I got a 750. Or I got a 650. Or I got a 600. Or an 850. I got a double pumper. I got a vacuum secondary. Um... And without like really understanding and knowing um, what what any of that means, and uh, a good example of that is my dad. Uh, when I was building the carburetor for my for my LS, he was telling me that you could I should just buy a brand new carburetor, throw it on, and it would run fine. And the fact of the matter is, if I had actually listened to him and done that, uh, I would have been in no better shape than I am now. And I would have learned a lot less than I would have if I just worked on the carburetor that I had. All right, so secret number one would have to be getting an air fuel ratio gauge, an AFR gauge, a wide band O2 sensor gauge, whatever you want to call it. Basically, without that, um, you are basically leaving so much power and mileage, MPG, and you're just leaving it on the table and it really negates any kind of gains that you would have. Uh, versus fuel injection if you don't have a properly tuned carburetor this is just basically you know uh, what a lot of people like to call a um, a metered fuel leak and if this the fuel leaks not metered correctly you're not going to have a very good uh, atomization and your engine's going to run either a little too rich or a little too lean uh, which i do need to inform you guys that if you're above a specific amount that your engine doesn't like you're going to lose mileage and you're going to lose power it doesn't matter uh, what situation that is in uh, you got to be somewhere between uh, 12 and a half to 14 and a half and your engine will likely want to be sitting around there but if you're tuning and you're trying to come up with all these these scenarios where your engine might be or might not be then you're, you're really just like you're just going at it blind and you're just going to be uh, shooting yourself in the foot a lot of those situations secret number two would probably have to be that understand what is on your engine and understand how that matches up with the carburetor that you've got on it so um i'm going to take this uh this is a 650 yeah no it's a 600 vacuum secondary this has been the staple for like automotive enthusiasts for i want to say 50 years everybody loves this carburetor it, it runs phenomenal in a bunch of in a bunch of different applications and it, it's always been great Everybody loves this type of carburetor, ver, ver, whether it's a vacuum secondary or a mechanical secondary, everybody loves this carburetor. But a lot of people say, well, if I run a 600, I'm going to be leaving a lot of power. I'm going to lose a lot of power if I don't use a 600. The second secret is running the smallest carburetor you can on an engine without it losing power. I, I forgot what, what YouTube show it was that it demonstrated the differences between a 650, a 750, and an 850 on, on dynos. And although the biggest carburetor made the most amount of power, it dipped so much. Imagine that the 600 makes this amount this amount of power, and the 750 or the 800 make about this much. And, but the rest of the power curve is like way down. So you want to get the smallest carburetor you can to promote the most amount of vacuum. So that way you can have the best amount of atomization and whatever fuel gets dumped in there has a higher chance of igniting. And if you have a nice fat flame, you're going to make more power. Maybe not at the very, very top end. But like I mentioned uh, with the Demon, just because it's all chamfered and nice and polished, it doesn't mean 
it's perfect for every single application. If you're, if this is a cruiser, if this is in your 69 Impala uh, with a 327, you're gonna be cruising down the freeway. You, you're not touching on your 400 horsepower, 500 horsepower, 600 horsepower. You are touching in whatever horsepower is in the RPM range, and that's that's 2,000 RPMs plus or minus 500 RPMs depending on your gearing, right? And that's where most of us regular people, cruisers, tuners, drivers, most of us spend the most amount of time in that RPM range, and we got to focus our efforts to make that part of the RPM range uh, the most efficient as possible. And then these old carburetors, even though they're not all fancy and stuff, they still give you the potential to get that power up top. You're just going to need to play with it a little bit. Chances are that by the time you're done playing with it, you're going to have less invested in building one of these than if you were to buy a brand new one of those and it's going to run better because it's built specific to your engine not all the engines are the same and each engine requires a specific type of carburetor combination you can't just go and call this guy up with this really i, I know a couple of carburetor builders and i'm not knocking on them but they tune their carburetors on a dyno but dynos don't simulate real world conditions as much as they'd like to try you know that's stuff that you got to tune yourself and only you know about these kinds of little inconveniences with your car uh maybe the specific uh, you're using an unorthodox automatic transmission and it pulls like this you know it, it just doesn't work and the best person who knows your car is usually yourself and you should be the one tuning it and if you're not making the adjustments you should at least be the one informing the person that's doing the adjustments hey this is happening and i want to take care of this but if the person who's fixing up your carburetor is halfway across the country and you got to ship it there and they got to ship it back and you got to ship it there you know it, you're better off just learning how to do these small adjustments on your own we're going to jump into the secret number three most of the power relies in the metering block so where most of the power is um, controlled for the most part is in this metering block. So you've got a couple different circuits you want to look at. You've got your power valve and you've got your uh, transition or uh, your idle feed right here. And then you've got your emulsions. The primary problems that I see in carburetors uh, when they're put into these applications uh, is the number one thing that I see is that you you have this kind of like a stumble. You have this stumble right off of, like as soon as you're taking off from a stop sign or something, and you have this stumble, and it, it lasts for a little bit, and then it goes away, and then when you try to accelerate from there a little bit, it'll stumble again, and a lot of people like to blame that on the accelerator pump, but what, if you have your wideband O2 sensor, and you're notice that you're, you're probably going to notice that you're having a lean condition, uh, that lasts more than a few seconds and you you got to remember that the pump shot only lasts for about a second or two anything more than that and it's probably in the metering block so chances are you're gonna a lot of these older uh, stock carburetors or older um, performance carburetors they have really small um, transition or idle feed circuits and you're gonna want to have them drilled out or drill them out yourself to the appropriate size now remember that you can only drill up you can't drill back down so usually these either have like a 28 or a 30 or a, or a 32 um, and then you're going to want to go up 0 0.002 at a time so you're probably going to need a set of gauge pins along with the set of um, jewelers drill bits so you got these little tiny tiny drill bits uh, that are designed for drilling super tiny things like that and then you've got a gauge pin set that you can use kind of looks like this and they're just they're just pins right all right so this doesn't have a power valve and you're going to see these little channels right here this is what your these two little holes are what dictate how much fuel you're going to get at wide open throttle a lot of you guys a lot of you guys know what the power valve um, does basically what it does is it allows more fuel to enter your carburetor during low vacuum app um, uh, during low vacuum situations so like when you're at wide open throttle or things like that, your power valve is gonna open. The best way to tune this is um, first decide when your power valve is gonna open. And you're not gonna be able to know that without your air fuel gauge. So I'm gonna stop repeating myself, but you do need a, an air fuel gauge, right? Without the air fuel gauge, you won't be able to do any of this. All of this is void. The first thing you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna block off this power valve, right? And what you're gonna do is after you block off the power valve, 
you're going to just focus on tuning your primary circuit and your t uh, secondary circuit jetting. What that means is that you're when you're getting on the freeway, not flooring it, when you're getting on the freeway, when you're trying to merge, things like that, you're going to be able to see what the air fuel ratio is on uh, for your low speed, um, and for your primaries, and then you're going to be able to see uh, what everything's like in the high um, secondaries. And then after you've got your jetting set up, then you're going to test out, you're going to take your block off back out, and then you're going to install the power valve back in. Then you're going to find out where you need the opening, and that's when you floor it, right? So you're going to um, gently take it to up a cruise, and then you're going to go ahead and smash the throttle, right? So you're going to, when you smash the throttle, it's just basically going to force it open. And when you're going to, typically, you're going to see it go rich, right? When Whenever the it's suddenly, um, when you suddenly go from, from part throttle to wide open, you're going to have it go rich because your accelerator pump's going to pump, and then this thing opens, and then as soon as it opens, it's going to start drawing in fuel after about a second. It's going to start drawing a ton of fuel, depending on, on what's here. Uh, if you don't have this tuned correctly, or if you try to tune this on a stock application, um, or if you leave it alone on a stock application, I mean, you're going to find out that you're actually either leaning out on the top end, or you're too rich and you start to have like a rich miss, or the fuel actually puts out the spark, and it's going to make it seem like you're actually having like a, an ignition issue when it's actually a fueling issue. So without the air fuel gauge or fuel ratio, it's not going to work. Uh, after you're in the tens, it might still be okay. It depends on how much air and what the RPM is. Uh, usually in the higher RPMs, it, you can deal with a little bit more rich mixture. But you usually don't want to be in that that rich of a condition if you're not a full out race performance engine or if you're not boosted uh, which we're not going to get into right now so it just depends on how much air you're flowing but typically for a street application you want to be right around the 12 and a half 13 and a half range that's going to be the happy spot for your engine um, hands down every single time so the best thing to do is um, you can go ahead you can get these aftermarket metering blocks that have they're 75 bucks. Um, you only need one, actually. You only need the primary. They're 75 bucks each or 90 bucks each, something like that. And you only need the primary side because the primary side is where all the magic happens. So you're going to have access to removable bleeds for the uh, primary or for the um, idle fee restriction and the power valve uh, channel restrictions. Uh, and those are the ones where the most of the tuning is going to happen. And then the rest is just going to be just like if you had an updated casting of a newer holly now i touched up on this a little bit um, earlier in the video but i i want to reiterate this for my fourth point is that each engine is special right each engine um, was designed with a specific carburetor in mind and each carburetor is designed to work with the specific engine uh, it just kind of works the way it is these uh, oems or the automotive uh, manufacturers uh, took these carburetors and they had them tuned and tuned and tuned and tuned. they spent thousands and thousands and thousands uh, probably even up in the tens of thousands um, having the carburetor tuned on their test vehicles and then that carburetor they sent to Holly or whoever was making their carburetors and they had them um, put all the settings into that and that specific model has a specific carburetor that's why in certain applications uh, people go nuts for like the specific 427 carburetor that only made like it was only made for like 67 and 68 and blah blah blah. You know, uh, those carburetors are probably the best carburetor. Well, the performance ones are probably the best carburetors for that specific engine because the OEMs already spent all the money getting that carburetor uh, to how it needs to perform in order for the car to run its best. Uh, while also meeting any kind of like emissions restrictions. The problem then lies that when we take these original OEM motors and we take the stock cast iron intake manifolds off and we put an aluminum one and we take the manifolds off, the exhaust manifolds, and then we put a nice set of long tube headers on there and maybe we change, you know, the accessory drive is now different uh, or maybe change the transmission as well and maybe change out the pistons, now it's a higher compressor, you know. Now... The car is the same, but the engine is now different. And because the engine is now different, the carburetor is not going to respond. So the first thing people did was they, they took off their OEM carburetors, 
they went out and bought a performance oriented carburetor that dumped in a little bit more fuel that's basically all it does all these aftermarket ones and stuff all they do is dump in a little bit more fuel and just richen up the entire curve and have their cars perform like they're supposed to because when you add all these extra components you have a lot more air flowing you tend to run a little bit leaner the oem carburetors don't keep up so you got to install something that flows a little bit more fuel that's just kind of the way it is but the problem then lies that you have all these carburetors that are now mismatched with the engine people think okay so it's it's a 426 or a 427 i'm going to put in the 750 and it's gonna it's gonna run really good and you know it doesn't quite work that way you going back to my earlier points you want to size your carburetor uh to the engine that you want to you can get your 750 uh maybe in a vacuum secondary so you're riding mostly on the primaries uh but chances are you're going to want something that'll flow with the rest of your engine usually i like to stick to a 650 or a 600 and though i have very few issues um we put a 750 on our duster and um, it actually feels fairly sluggish compared to even my truck that has a 650. But then again, my truck has a perfectly tuned poly carburetor. And the other one has a 750 that was just kind of slapped on. Going to suit your specific engine combination and needs. Um, they might get close, uh, but they're not, they're not going to be able to do it all. This is turning out to be a really long video. But the very last point I want to bring out to you is... Arm yourself with as much knowledge as you can. Not everybody knows what they're talking about. Even I might get some of these points wrong. But the more people you listen to, the more everything starts to kind of make sense. Uh, car manufacturers are only um, really interested in zero to 60 times or you know, um, horsepower numbers or dyno numbers or a bend tracing or things like that. Uh, they're not really concerned with like the person who's like daily driving and stuff. Uh, they do try to put these carburetors out, but without knowing exactly what is going on, uh, those brand new carburetors seem to miss the mark completely. So you just start with slapping on that uh, wide band and then figuring out what your uh, AFR gauge. Chances are, after you get your your AFR down to the 13, I usually try to stick to a 13, but to get the AFR that you want, you're not going to want to buy a brand new carburetor because you're like, wow. This thing really woke the engine up. If you can get, uh, oh, by the way, 13 to 13 and a half produces maximum amount of torque. And you, when you're cruising, you don't really feel horsepower. The majority of what you're feeling is torque anyway. So really, you're, you want to tune for torque. So anywhere around 13 is fine. Um, so when you're going around um, uh, tuning this thing, you're not going to want to buy uh, any other carburetor. You're going to want to stick to your Holly, and you're going to want to tune it. If you want change the intake, you're going to be able to tune it. If you change the exhaust, you're going to be able to tune it. Arm yourselves with knowledge. Get yourself the tools that you need. You really don't need much. Uh, a couple different types of screwdrivers, you know. If you were, if when you guys start getting serious or you guys want better high speed performance, you can go ahead and switch out to annular type boosters and eliminate your choke plate um, if that's one of your thing. Um, those seem to work really, really well. It's not that expensive to have new boosters installed on your on your bodies. Uh, that seems to be one of the best things that you can do for your carburetor. But it really doesn't take much. It takes a couple hand tools that you probably already have. It takes a gauge that doesn't cost you that much in the long run. It really pays for itself after you fix the MPG on your car. And, you know, you can't put a price on smiles per gallon. So with all that wrapped up together, I know this is a really long video. I'm really sorry, so I'm going to cut it down. Um, hopefully it doesn't end up being 20 minutes with it. It's, it's no promises. Um, so with all that put together, I hope this really helps somebody. If you guys have any questions, you guys are more than welcome to throw them in the comment section below. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Night Wrencher out.